Structural Issues for Home Inspectors This course will help prepare the home inspector to observe and report on structural components and their condition in a residential property. The structural portion of a home inspection is perhaps the single most important part. A house's structural integrity is often the issue of the greatest interest to home buying clients. If the home is structurally unsound, not much else matters. This is why it's critical for the inspector to be confident in his ability to observe and report on what he sees during the structural portion of a home inspection. But it isn't enough to simply look at the foundation and framing elements. Almost every part of a home reveals what's going on with its structure. The course improves the inspector's awareness of structural defects, helps him avoid misdiagnosing problems, and defines his role in performing the structural portion of a home inspection. The course is open to all and includes three short quizzes and a 65-question final exam. Upon passing the final exam, members can download and print their own certificate of completion. The course and the final exam assume that you already have a basic understanding of the structural components of a home. Reporting structural observations is part of a home inspector's job. Offering a definitive determination as to the cause of any defects or anomalies is not. So, remember, home inspectors are barred from providing engineering services. The job of the home inspector is to observe and report. This course is designed to help you do just that. In this section of the course, let's learn about some common terms or phrases that are used in the construction and building industry, particularly related to the residential building. Understanding construction terminology and knowing the purposes of building components and framing members, for example studs, plates, load-bearing walls, will help a home inspector to do a better home inspection. Even though most building components are not readily accessible and are not readily visible to a home inspector performing a home inspection on an existing, already built house, it's important to know how buildings and homes are built. Sometimes defects can be seen by a home inspector because the hidden, covered, or inaccessible system or component has a problem. The illustration shows some of the load-bearing and non-load-bearing walls of a building. A bearing wall, or a load-bearing wall, is designed to carry the weight of structural components above through itself and to the supporting components below. Removal of or modification to bearing walls without specific design considerations can lead to loss of structural integrity of the dwelling. Sometimes the structural weakness is seen almost immediately. In other cases, the weakness is discovered only over time. This is a horizontally placed wooden, steel, or engineered member which supports floor framing members. It is a primary support member and is often supported by wooden or steel columns or posts, exterior walls, or foundational elements. A masonry column is a vertical compression member whose height exceeds three times its thickness and whose width is less than one and one-half times its thickness. A column might be a slender vertical structure compression member, such as a post. A column supports loads that act primarily in the direction of its longitudinal vertical axis. This describes an assembly of perhaps three or even four vertical studs nailed together tightly to make up a corner framing element in a dwelling. This describes a grouping of short studs commonly found over or sometimes below openings, such as for windows and doors where a full-length stud could not fit. Typically seen at the bottom of the foundation or stem walls, the footing is generally made of poured reinforced concrete. Often wider than the foundation wall, the footing bears the full weight of the dwelling. In some instances, when the soil is not completely compacted or is wet, a spread footing is designed and installed. Precast foundation walls can make building foundations more simple for the builder. Precast foundations simplify basement construction and can save time and money. 
Precast foundations can also provide warmer, drier basements for homeowners. The precast walls are built of high-strength concrete panels that are manufactured off-site at a factory. Each precast panel could be an entire reinforced concrete wall section or may contain solid concrete studs designed for load-bearing support, and they are incorporated into a concrete footing that is already attached to the foundation wall or foundation stud section. That's what makes it simple to install. It's already built, and the builder simply set the components in place. Some precast panels will include rigid insulation to keep the basement warmer and reinforcement rebar and polyproline fibers for strength. The concrete studs may have a wooden strip on the inside surface of the stud to be used for finishing the basement construction. The illustration shows two types of precast concrete foundation walls and footings. The foundation is the wall below the floor nearest grade serving as a support for a structural part of a home. The foundation is supported by a footing. Typically, a header is a horizontally placed wooden framing member that is made to support the load when an opening is made in a load-bearing wall. Headers are usually installed above windows and exterior doors, or wherever an opening is made in an interior load-bearing partition. A jack stud is a wooden member or stud placed at the sides of an opening in a load-bearing partition and designed to support a header assembly above. Jack studs are sometimes called trimmers or trimmer studs. The header is supported by a jack stud at each end. Jacks fit under each end of a header and they transfer the load that the header carries down to the bottom plate and the framing beneath. Sometimes, jack studs must be doubled on wide openings so there's enough supporting surface for the header to bear on. Jacks may be replaced with a steel header hanger attached to the king's stud if the code permits. Check the illustration. These members are typically made of dimensional lumber, although some products called TJIs, the abbreviation for the Manufacturer Trust Joint International, are also used. The purpose of the joist is to provide a nailing and support system for the floor sheathing and for the floor itself. The joist supports the live and dead loads placed on the floor assembly. TJIs, or the equivalent, are like many wooden I-beams with 2x2 two two square stock on the top and bottom cords and plywood or oriented strand board OSB between the two. Attic or ceiling joists are used to provide floor support in attic spaces and also help prevent the roof rafters from collapsing downward and pushing outward. King studs are connected or fastened to jack studs or trimmer studs. King studs are full height studs. King studs support the assembly between the top and bottom plates. See jack stud. A pier is a sturdy point, typically at or below ground level, and generally constructed of concrete or a similar material, which supports a point load transferred from above. An example of this would be a pier installed below grade and covered by a concrete basement slab, on top of which rests a steel lolly column supporting a wooden girder assembly. A pier is defined as an isolated vertical column of masonry whose horizontal dimension measured at right angles to its thickness is not less than three times its thickness nor greater than six times its thickness and whose height is less than five times its length. A pilaster is a masonry structural element defined by its sectional configurations and heights. A masonry pilaster is a vertical member of uniform cross-section built as an integral part of a wall, which may serve as either a vertical beam or column, or both. A pilaster projects from one or both faces of an unreinforced wall and usually projects in a reinforced wall. Pilasters are similar to columns, except that pilasters are laterally supported in the direction of the wall, while columns are typically unsupported in both directions. Masonry foundations may have pockets built into the walls to support the ends of beams. A concrete block foundation might have a pilaster built to support the beam end. P 
pitch is the incline of the roof expressed as a fraction derived by dividing the rise by the span, where the roof span is the distance between the outside of one wall's top plate to another. A post is a vertical member which may be made of steel, concrete, wood, or masonry materials. It is designed to carry a point load vertically downward onto a pier or block. Typically, this is the wooden framing member extending from the ridge to beyond the top plate of an exterior wall, or serving as a connecting point between two sloping sections of the roof structure. Though this is the most common description, there are other named rafters that are installed in a slightly different manner. For example, a jack rafter, short, may not extend to the top plate, but may connect a variety of structural roofing components. The ridge or ridge beam is installed at the intersection of roof rafters at their uppermost point. Ridge beams are typically made of wooden components. Be advised that not all roof structures require a ridge beam. On high sloping roofs, the ridge beam may be comprised of thin materials used only as a nailing point or spacer. This may be seen where no horizontal support is needed. On lower sloping roofs, the ridge actually carries a load and should be comprised of properly sized materials suitable for the purpose. A roof truss is a pre-engineered assembly of smaller individual framing components attached together and in a design suited to provide greater support and economy, as well as a faster installation time. It takes the place of rafters, attic or ceiling joists, and ridge beams, and is hoisted and nailed in place, forming the entire roof and attic structure. A roof truss spans the distance between exterior walls and requires no additional support. It is designed to take the guesswork out of field framing for the connecting points for intricate or multiple roof lines, tray and cathedral ceilings, roof penetrations, etc. I'm going to jump in and you should be aware of the different parts of a truss as well. So figure out the triangles going around the outside. The bottom cord here is going to be the bottom piece of it. Then the top part of the triangle is going to be our top cords. So we were showing the one down here and the one up above it. And all the inside pieces, those are going to be our web members. Also, you should be aware of gusset plates. Gusset plates can be either metal or wood. Some areas, they don't want to use metal gusset plates because under fire loads or direct flame content or contact, they end up shifting and twisting. Um, and then you get catastrophic failure of everything else that comes in there. With all trusses down the center line, and they're not showing in this picture, but we should see something called a catwalk, which will run along the bottom cord of our trusses. And, you know, that's just to keep them from twisting in and out. This describes the outer skin of the dwelling. Seething is attached to the outside of walls and roof assemblies. It can be comprised of fibrous materials, such as Celotex, backer board, or other materials in older homes, plywood, particle board, planking, or OSB, among other materials. Sheathing or roofs may also be referred to as roof decking. The first course of horizontal lumber placed on top of and attached to the foundation wall is known as the sill plate. Slope is the incline of the roof expressed as a ratio of the vertical rise to the horizontal run, where the run is some portion of the span. This ratio is always expressed as inches per foot. A roof that rises 4 inches for every 1 foot or 12 inches of run is said to have a 4 and 12 slope. If the rise is 6 inches for every 12 inches of run, then the roof slope is 6 and 12. The slope can be expressed numerically as a ratio. The slope ratio represents a certain amount of vertical rise for every 12 inches of horizontal run. For example, a 4 and 12 slope can be expressed as the ratio of 4 to 12. 
a 6 and 12 slope is expressed as 6 to 12. A framed wooden stud wall is an assembly of studs that are usually sized 2 inches by 4 inches or 2 inches by 6 inches in residential wood frame wall construction. The wood studs are usually spaced 16 or 24 inches on center. The studs in a wall are sandwiched between the top and bottom plates, boards that hold the ends of the studs in place. The top plate can be made of either one or two boards. Double plating at the top of a stud wall is most common on load-bearing walls unless the roof rafters or trusses and floor joists stack directly over the studs in the wall. Then a single top plate may be used if permitted by the local code inspector. In platform framing, this is the first course of horizontally placed lumber that goes on top of the subflooring material. It comprises the bottom of exterior walls and interior partitions where vertically positioned studs are attached. A subfloor is comprised of materials, usually plywood, OSB, or planking, which are attached to joists and make up the top structural portion of the platform assembly on which occupants walk. In this section of the course, let's take a general look at different types of foundations that are commonly observed during a home inspection. Actually, the foundation system and its components are not readily visible during a visual-only home inspection. Take a look at this illustration of a ground-supported slab. The reinforced concrete slab is poured on the ground, but there is usually a gravel or stone layer below the concrete slab and above the undisturbed soil. The footing is below the foundation wall and supports the foundation. The superstructure is a term that is referencing the load-bearing wood framing of the exterior wall of the structure. A slab on grade foundation is a type of foundation consisting of a structural concrete slab poured onto the ground, but usually there is a layer of gravel and a vapor retarder between the ground and concrete. View illustration of a slab on grade installation. No accessible space exists in slab on grade construction. Slab on grade foundations are popular in areas where there is a high water table. For example, there are very few full basements in southern Florida. In general terms, a slab on grade foundation is poured on the grade or ground. A crawl space is an accessible space between the ground and the bottom of the first floor of a home. A crawl space is also referred to as an underfloor space that is not a basement. The story of the house that is entirely above the grade or ground surface is usually referred to as the main first floor. The illustration shows a crawl space with foundation walls, footings under the foundation, the footings on top of the undisturbed soil, and the wood floor framing resting upon the top of the foundation. A full basement creates an accessible space between the ground and the bottom of the first floor of a home. Full basements are popular predominantly in cold climates where the footer needs to be below the frost line. In the illustration, you can see a one-story house with a basement. The space below the first floor is the basement, and the basement is mostly below the ground surface. Oftentimes, the house will have the HVAC system, hot water source, main electrical panel, and laundry appliances in the basement. The foundation walls are supported by footers or footings. Pier foundations, like slab on grade foundations, are typically installed in areas that do not have the proper type of soil to support a full basement foundation. Precast wall sections are cast in a factory and shipped to the construction site. Sections are then lifted into place on a simple gravel footing and bolted together. The wall sections are then sealed. There are two common styles of wood framing, balloon and platform. The main difference between balloon and platform framing is apparent at the floor lines. The balloon wall studs extend from the sill of the foundation all the way to the top plate of the second floor. 
The platform framed wall, on the other hand, is independent for each floor. Balloon framing. Balloon framing is an older method of wood framing that utilizes long, continuous framing members, <clears throat> studs, that run from sill to eaves, with intermediate floor platforms nailed to them. Once popular, when long lumber was plentiful, balloon framing has been largely replaced by platform framing. However, balloon framing is growing in popularity again in light gauge steel stud construction. For light gauge steel, long framing members are not as much of an issue. Some electricians prefer working in balloon frame buildings because the lack of fire blocking makes it much easier to add circuits. Home inspectors should be able to explain that in balloon framing, there exist chases for fire to quickly travel from floor to floor. This hazard can be mitigated by the use of fire stops at each floor level, but fire stops can't always be confirmed by home inspectors. Balloon framing has been outlawed by building codes in many areas because of the fire danger that it poses. Again, this can be mitigated by adding fire stops. The home inspector might notice a downslope in the floor toward the central walls caused by differential shrinkage of the wood framing members at its perimeter. In platform framing, the joists comprise any number of individual floors or platforms that wall framing components are constructed on top of, hence the term platform framing. Platform framing is the most common method of frame construction. The floor or platform is made up of joists that sit on supporting walls, beams, or girders and cover it with a plywood or OSB subfloor. In the past, one biplank set at 45 degrees to the joists were used for the subfloor. Floor joists can be engineered lumber trusses or I-beams that have increased rigidity and longer spans with the added benefit of conserving natural resources. They allow easier access for runs of plumbing, HVAC, etc. You are not required to walk the roof in order to perform a complete home inspection. If you are using a ladder on your inspection, choose a location that is well away from all power lines. Coming into contact with live wires can be fatal. If you transport your ladder on the roof of your vehicle, the ladder may become wet, so dry off the rungs before climbing it. Place the ladder on level ground and open it completely, making sure all locks are engaged. Read telescopic ladder instructions carefully. Use the 4 to 1 rule for extension ladders which states that for each four feet of distance between the ground and the upper point of contact, such as the roof, move the base of the ladder out one foot. Always face the ladder when climbing, and wear slip-resistant, rubber-soled shoes. Keep your body centered on the ladder and gauge your safety by your belt buckle. If your buckle passes beyond the ladder rail, you are overreaching and at risk of falling. Stand at or below the highest safe standing level on a ladder. For a step ladder, the safe standing level is the second rung from the top, and for an extension ladder, it's the fourth rung from the top. Risks of inspecting a roof attic include falling through the floor or ceiling of the level below, bumping your head on rafters or collar ties, breathing insulation dust, and coming into accidental contact with exposed wiring. Be conscious of these risks while inspecting an attic. Many inspectors can tell you horror stories from falling through the floors or stepping where they shouldn't be stepping. So if you're going to be walking up in the attic, you know, do your best to be careful up there. Try not to disturb the insulation. Make sure you walk softly, or I should say feel your way before you take that step. Make sure you're standing on top of a ceiling joist. You're going to be surprised that sometimes those ceiling joists aren't quite where you think they're going to be. And if you go ahead and place your pressure of your foot there, you're going to end up putting your foot right through the drywall. Not only is it embarrassing, but it basically costs more than the inspection to get that fixed. Crawl spaces pose the riskiest part of a home inspection. Dangers include bumping your head, breathing insulation dust, exposure to rodents and their droppings, 
which can lead to illness, exposure to mold, cutting yourself on sharp duct edges, touching exposed wiring, and contact with snakes, spiders, and even wild animals. It is unwise to inspect a crawl space without letting someone know of your location. Never enter a crawl space that has standing water in it. And let me emphasize the standing water. You don't know why that water is there. I mean, it could be a rainwater, which really wouldn't be too much of a problem if it's fresh. But if it stays there for a long time and it becomes stagnant, then it could be very unhealthy. We also don't know because if there's any plumbing leaks in there. Um, we're going to have all our waste lines typically run through the crawl spaces as well. If there's a leak in the sewage, well, that's going to be falling on top of the crawl space where we're going to be you know, crawling. And it doesn't take much to get a staph infection. And those staph infections, they, you know, we've had people that actually lost legs and fingers and toes. And the bottom line is we just don't get paid that much. So in Illinois, when we do our inspections and crawl spaces, we do have to document how we inspected it. So that means if you looked on the inside or you used a crawl butt or if you just ended up crawling out throughout the whole thing. But remember, for the amount of money that we're making, just it's just not worth it. Don't go crazy. Don't get yourself sick. Wear the gloves. Wear the overalls. Keep your clothes and everything else clean. Something that you could strip back um, when you're coming out of there so you don't drag all that dirt to the inside. This is the end of this section. So please look for the quizzes. Take those. I hope this is enjoyable. And again, don't be afraid to reach out if you got any questions. Thank you.